Hello and welcome to another episode of Battles and Beers War Stories. I'm your host, Nick Laidlaw. Today we're going to be talking about World War I short stories. All of these stories were submitted to me by the family members of the veterans that we're going to be talking about. So these are going to be letters, diaries, and secondhand stories told by the surviving family members. World War I, also known as the Great War, was a global conflict that lasted from 1914 to 1918. It was sparked by the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria-Hungary and quickly escalated into a large-scale war involving many of the world's greatest powers. This war was characterized and made unique by the trench warfare and new technologies such as the machine guns and chemical weapons and extremely high casualty rates. The war also had far-reaching consequences, leading to the collapse of several different empires, the redrawing of national borders, and significant political and social changes across the globe. The war's aftermath led to the Treaty of Versailles, which imposed heavy reparations and territorial losses on Germany, setting the stage for economic hardship and political instability in the country, setting up the stage for the Second World War. Additionally, the war accelerated technological advancements and changed the nature of warfare as a whole. The enormous human and economic toll of World War I, coupled with the unresolved issues left in its wake, laid the groundwork for the outbreak of World War II just two decades after, making the Great War one of the most pivotal events in human history. Now, World War I is characterized by its unprecedented human man-made horrors that deeply impacted the civilians and soldiers involved. The introduction of industrialized warfare led to the widespread use of trenches, resulting in appalling living conditions and extreme physical and psychological suffering for soldiers on the front lines. The war also saw the deployment of devastating new technologies such as poison gas, tanks, heavy artillery, and machine guns, leading to massive amounts of casualties and severe injuries on both sides. The scale of death and destruction, coupled with the prolonged and grueling nature of the conflict, caused profound trauma and left a lasting legacy of suffering for those involved in it. What I'm about to read to you now are the stories of the men who lived through that time. This first story comes from Victor Freyberger, a chief warrant officer in the Imperial German Army from the Alsatian region of Europe. He fought from 1914 to 1918. He says, I belonged to the Landwehr, and I was called on the second day of mobilization. On November 1st, 1914, we were engaged in hard fighting on the heights of St. Marie au Main. Our adversaries were very skillful young French regiments. Our battalion was suffering great losses. From the 42 dead in the first days of November 1914, I knew several of these men. Late in November, some of my friends, who were from cities nearby, and before winter, we changed positions because many of us Alsatians went to join the French lines. So, the deserters became more numerous every day. The fighting during the nights of Christmas to New Year, and especially on January 26 and 27, 1915, were hard, and the French who attacked had great losses, and they were obligated to withdraw, leaving several hundred dead bodies behind. To clean this battlefield as such, to bury these few hundred French soldiers who were in the streets, houses, gardens, and courtyards of these villages, the German command had assigned me to bury these corpses using an armed company of young Berliners aged 16 to 17. This work lasted two days, and after that I could return to my regiment. In the spring of 1915, the German high command ordered the withdrawal from the Western Front of all Alsatians because so many were deserting in the French lines. Half of our 99th Battalion was sent to Russia, and the other half to Trier. I was lucky enough to be able to stay in Trier for a few months and in the summer of 1915. I was enrolled in a regiment around Verdun. In the trenches there around Verdun, I fought for 14 months. The worst experience of my life. By the end of 1916, I was seen as a pro-French suspect, and I was removed from the front line and sent to the Rhine, where I was able to stay almost a year and a half as an instructor. The service was rough and long, but far from danger. In the spring of 1918, as the war with Russia was over, it was decided to send the Alsatians in the most dangerous places, especially in the north, where the English were, and here I am, in the month of May, in the Battle of Cambrai against the English. It was hard and relentless, 
and our losses were considerable due to artillery, infantry, aircraft, and the dreaded gas. The front advanced and retreated. Our air force and artillery were too weak. The 1st of August, 1918, I was wounded by an English bullet at 4 a.m. and carried by four soldiers. I was very weak, so the doctor ordered to discharge me for surgery as soon as possible. On the second day, I was operated on, and the English bullet was removed. I was in surgery for a second time on November 4th, 1918, and sent home on leave where my father had just died, on November 5th, the day of revolution when the German Empire collapsed. From November 5th to 17th, we were, so to speak, without government. The Germans, the army, the state employees left and crossed the Rhine, and we were happy to see the French soldiers on Sunday. On November 18th, a French regiment arrived in our village. We were liberated. The war lasted more than four years, and we became French again. Long live France. This was Victor Freyberger of the 99th Infantry Regiment in the Imperial German Army. This next story is written from a sergeant to the mother of one of his soldiers who was killed. He was an Australian soldier in the 22nd Battalion. The letter is dated 20th of September, 1916. It reads, Dear Mrs. Coban, I am taking the liberty of writing you a few lines in connection with your son, Bert. The first time I met him, I took a great fancy to him, and we were best friends until he met his death. In fact, the whole battalion was very fond of him. He was one of those sort of chaps everyone had taken their lighting to, because he was very agreeable, obliging, and one who would do anything to assist when trouble occurred. He and I made a sort of agreement that if anything occurred to one or the other, the one that was left of the two had to write. I might assure you that his end came very quickly, and he felt no pain whatsoever, which was one good blessing in this place. I remain sincerely yours, W. Johnson, Sergeant, 22nd Battalion, 20th September, 1916. This next story was submitted to me by the great nephew of um, a French soldier who fought at Verdun. He recounts this story as such. The fighting for the hill claimed roughly 20% of the company in just 24 hours. Upon our arrival, midway up the hill, I found the trench we were to occupy was only waist high, with the majority of it being pulverized by the German shelling. We walked, under a barrage, into the holes, and I was ordered at once to move the wounded we had already accumulated, being quite a number of them, back down the hill as soon as the barrage lightened. I did as I was told, but because of the situation, we waited two and a quarter hours before we could move the wounded men under relative safety. The dead were left midway up the hill. They were laid neatly in a row at the foot of the trench. We were to come back for them, but their poor bodies were mashed into a paste when we returned. This was the only time the German artillery allowed us to move with relative freedom on the hillside. The next four days we spent inside a deep crater waiting for our chance to be relieved. Around 85% of the company had been killed or wounded during that time. Again, that was a French soldier, um, great uncle Emile, uh, his story recounted by his great nephew, Jean. This next story comes from my own family, Lance Corporal William Laidlaw in 1917. He recounted this story to my uncle in the late 70s. It reads, It was 1917, a year after the Somme. There had been a lot of shelling that day, and consequentially, a lot of casualties. The British had the best of the exchanges, and captured several hundred German prisoners. I had been left in charge of a group of 20 stretcher bearers by the sergeant, who, being wounded in the arm, had been sent to the rear. The many wounded, German and British, were laying around waiting to be taken back to the hospitals. The situation was getting out of hand, and a doctor asked me to try to get the wounded moved to the rear, because if a shell landed amongst them, it would be a disaster. I responded that with only 20 men, it was impossible to do more. Four men were needed per stretcher because of the shell hold ground. Suddenly, I looked up and saw the British infantry were bringing the German prisoners back. Remembering something I saw at the Battle of the Somme, I ran to the colonel of the Yorkshires and asked permission to use the captured prisoners to move the wounded. The colonel agreed. Running through the continuous shelling, I ran back and organized the German prisoners, irrespective of whether they were officers or not, as stretcher bearers. 
I persuaded the Germans to help move the wounded with an offer of hot meal as soon as they had completed the mission. Some of the British infantry were used as guards, as stretcher bearers were not armed. The German gunners would not fire on their own soldiers, and therefore, the task of moving the wounded was safely accomplished. A neat job, said the doctor afterwards. This praise meant more to me than anything else. I then continued assisting at the front as a stretcher bearer. That was Lance Corporal William Laidlaw of the Royal Army Medical Corps, 1917. This next story is the last letter home of a soldier who was killed in action just a day after he wrote the letter. He was a Lance Corporal of the 17th Battalion of the King's Liverpool Regiment. The letter is dated the 27th of April, 1918, and he was killed the 28th of April, 1918. The soldier's name was Lance Corporal Harry Gainford. His last letter reads as such. My dear Susie, I'm so sorry that I have not wrote to you a letter before now, but we have been on the move and in the line all the time. I have received all your letters now up to date, and I am quite pleased to see that you and Vera are both quite well. I think she talks a lot about her daddy. Poor little girl. I will be pleased to see you both after this lot, because I think about you many a time when in danger. I was given up this last week to be in Germany's hands, but leave that to me. I fought my way through and got out without a scratch, only I had no trousers on or shoes. I drove them off in the barbed wire. I was recommended on my brave stand by our general. I can tell you, Susie, it was just a fight for life and death. But I may say, I mowed them down with my Lewis gun, and I also got praise for sticking to my gun and getting back. Well, dear, I will tell you all about it when I get home. I don't know when that will be, but I am on the first on our list when it does start, and I am spitting blood every day expecting it to start. Well, Susie, I don't think I had better say more at this time, but I will tell you all the news when I get home. You can drop a letter to mother and tell her I'm quite all right. I sent her a field card off today and one for you. So remember me to all, father, mother, Liz, Sid, Flo, Amy, and my very best love to you and Vera. Your ever-loving husband, Lance Corporal Gainford. Good night and God bless you all. Harry would be killed the next day. This next story is submitted by Daniel Tomlin about his ancestor, uh, Captain Paul Strong, he was the victim of a gas attack, and his story reads, Fritz played a dirty trick on me the other day and almost got my number. He dropped a high explosive at the front of my dugout, which caused me to believe that the next might come through the roof. Recalling that oftentimes caution is the better part of valor, I concluded to take immediate refuge in a deeper dugout just to the rear. But Fritz had foiled my plan. At the moment of dropping a high explosive, he dropped a noiseless little gas shell at the rear entrance, and in a moment's time, the place was flooded with gas. I held my breath and tried to find my mask, but in the darkness, I could not do so. My mind worked like lightning. The wind was from the rear. By running out that direction, there was a possibility I might save my life after all, but I had to breathe. So I took one big inhale and made a quick getaway down the communication trench. That was all that saved me, as I finally reached the good, fresh air again. For about half an hour, I had a terrible coughing spell, but finally came around okay. Only the very quick, or the very dead, come through a phosphine gas bombardment. That's from Captain Paul Strong. For this last story, it's a little bit of a treat for me to share with you guys, because I'm not going to be the one telling it. This is from a family member of mine, Daniel Laidlaw. He was awarded the Victoria Cross for playing his bagpipes at the Battle of Luz in 1915. This is, in his words, what happened that day. It gives me a thrill to find you have brought the famous pipes of Luz with you, Laidlaw. Never go anywhere without them, sir. With men falling all around us in the trenches at Luz on the 25th of September 1915, when Lieutenant Young yelled out to me, Laidlaw, for God's sake, do something with your pipes. I played them over the top and went right on through the first line of German trenches, on to the second line where I was bowled over. Will you play the tune with which you piped the boys over the top?
This next story is from a Sergeant Willard Thomas, an American soldier fighting in France in 1918. He writes a letter home describing his first experience going over the top. He says, We were laying in the woods for several hours on the Chateau Thierry front. On one night, the orders came for the company to go up to the front, so we rolled up our packs and got ready. We set out after dark and were hiking all night. Arriving at the front in the early morning daylight, we were almost to the lines. Then the Germans began shelling us as we were in observation of the German lines. We had to do a double time to get to our own positions, which was just small holes dug in the ground, large enough to fit one to three men. After getting into the holes, we got shelled by gas, and we had our masks on for about 30 minutes. We laid in those holes all day and night, with nothing but corned beef and hard tack to eat. The Germans were shelling us most of the time, which kept us ducking. We stayed in our holes and lay low for the rest of the day. But about two o'clock, our lieutenant came around and told us to get ready because we were going over the top at three. Well, we got ready, and at 2.30, we waited for the word to go over the top, which came at three. And up and over we went into the wheat field. We went out with machine gun bullets falling all around us like hailstones. But while we were laying at the edge of the woods, we were under artillery fire, and I was twice as nervous there than I was out in the field under the machine gun. When a big artillery shell lands beside a fellow, he might as well just say goodbye, because if he don't, he's out of luck to say anything. Well, after we got out into the field, I forgot about everything, and we went after the devils. We would make advances about 30 or 40 yards and drop down, and the bullets were cutting the wheat, and the artillery shells were bursting all around us. It was hot as hell, and I had no water in my canteen, so I chewed wheat stalks to keep from aging from thirst. I had three bullets just miss me enough not to inflict a wound. One struck my helmet, the second hit my leg, just enough to make it bleed a little. The third one came close enough to make my neck burn. The Germans sure did thin us out. Believe me, after we got back and thought about it, we wondered how many of us came out alive. I have got a whole lot to talk about when I get home, believe me. Well, I guess I'll close this for a time. Hoping you are well, and that I will be home on my way soon. I am your friend, Willard. This last story, the soldier's family requested that they just be completely anonymous. This is what they had to say. In the 1970s, once I was old enough, I realized my grandfather never celebrated Christmas with us. I could tell he tried to be near us, especially the younger kids, but something was on his mind. I asked my father one day why grandfather never celebrated Christmas. He was a Christian, but seemed to hate the holiday. My father told me this story that his father told him. During Christmas Eve in 1917, I was trapped in a deep shell hole with a German soldier. He and I were down there the entire night freezing in the cold. I held a gun on him and he held a gun on me, both of us too afraid to shoot. It was the most terrifying and miserable night of my life. Dad told me later that he had actually shot the German, but he didn't die right away, and that my grandfather was too afraid and ashamed of what he had done to put the poor man out of his misery. I never blamed my grandfather for never celebrating Christmas with us ever again after that. Christmas Eve, he would go into his study, and I would just leave the man be. He had earned his right to seclusion on that day. It's the anonymous descendant of a British World War I veteran. I hope you guys really enjoyed this episode. If you or anyone you know has letters, diaries, or secondhand stories told by veterans from the First World War, Please send me a message on Facebook, Instagram, uh, YouTube comments, wherever. I would love to get that story documented and shared with people. Again, make sure to like and subscribe. Help the channel grow. I would love to do this full time uh, and document as many stories as possible for you guys. So once again, every soldier has a story and every story deserves to be told. Thanks for being here.